Hello, hello, hello. You're standing. This is so like a rock concert. I must confess, I am a feminist, but I gave myself a rock chick makeover this afternoon to feel worthy to interview our guest. She is a punk singer, writer, artist, and the front woman of the influential bands Bikini Kill and La Tigra. Her memoir, Rebel Girl, published by Echo Harper Collins, was an instant New York Times and Sunday Times bestseller. She is a staple in feminist publications, from college curriculums to best-selling books and a leading voice in the punk feminist movement. She has been named one of the best live performers of our time. Put your hands together and make incredible woo-hooing noises, break laws if necessary, to welcome Kathleen Hanna. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I have to say, I enjoyed your book so much. The preface made me cry. Just the introduction. Has anyone else read it yet? Yes. Have you, just give us a cheer if you haven't read it yet. Okay. If oh, just, good. Okay, so we, we can say some brand new stuff, or we can say stuff and you won't know what we're talking about. Yeah, but also those are the people that, who, who's yet to buy the book? Just give us a cheer if you yet to buy the book. Okay. You're the people we're really playing to. Um, those who've already bought and read the book, we love you, but you're not as relevant as the new sales. Um, I didn't say that. <laughs> I am not the I, one who said that. I said it. I said it. Um, I feel like you write in such a literary style, and often I read people's autobiographies, and they're brilliant at what they do. But do you ever find this, that they're kind of a bit prosaic, the way that they write? It's then this happened, and then this happened, and they're interesting anecdotes, but it doesn't feel like a raw uh, coming out of the soul. And I feel like when I read about you being an artist and like a visual artist and creating zines and performance poetry and it, obviously we know you best for your work in you know right girl punk I was like oh you're an absolute artist of the soul like how do you approach writing a book like this I did the thing where I put my butt in the chair and I wrote <laughs> I really had no idea what was going to happen. I just knew I really needed to say all this stuff so that I could move on with my life. Um, Cause I had a lot of stuff that like, I was telling the same stories to my friends over and over. And I was also sort of trapped in some of the trauma of the nineties, the trauma I experienced in the nineties, not just as an abuse survivor in general, but like playing shows in a feminist band back then was like a pretty sketchy proposition. And there was a lot of, like physical violence at shows. And when I would tell younger people about that, they were shocked because the few people who knew who or know who Bikini Kill are were like, had this idea of the 90s that like everybody loved us and was so excited. <laughs> and I was like, no. Um, and I'm still today, you know, I just got off tour and I had stuff happen on tour where, you know, I had to ask a bus driver, it was freezing in my bunk to turn up the heat. And I was having a thing where I'm like, am I allowed to ask for this? Because I was so trained by my early touring that if I asked for a bottle of water, I would get called difficult or a bitch. And um, also, if I just even get annoyed at something, it gets re the story gets retold as she was screaming at everyone and blah, blah, blah. But I just realized I can't change how I act because of stupid stereotypes and misperceptions. And part of it was letting, the, letting that bullshit, all those microaggressions and the sexism and stuff go so I could kind of process who I am now and move on. So I just sat down and started writing, pick titles. I collect titles. Does anybody do that? Like in your journal, like you just hear a sentence that's like funny and you write it down. So I would write down funny sentences or titles and then I would just... Be like, okay, what is that going to be? What is tip of the sister iceberg? What does that mean? And then I would just start writing. That's, that's so interesting. I do the same thing. I just hear little phrases in my head and I just put them down in my notes. And then later when I come to write, I think, is there any of this useful? Are there any gems here? Um, what did you learn from writing the book? I learned uh, that I had a lot of <laughs> healing to do. Not to be too kumbaya, but... 
Um, I got a trauma therapist, like a specific mm-hmm. trauma therapist. I have post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I don't know if y'all believe in that here, um, unless it's like a war survivor. But um, yeah, I have that. And I started getting help for it. My life got a lot better because, you know, I asked for little things like, don't sneak up behind me. Mm. <laughs> like I have a son and he got one of those buzzers, you know, like the funny man buzzer, like shake your hand and buzz me. And he shocked me on my shoulder and I like jumped out of my pants. I was like, what the fuck? Um, at a dinner party. And I was so embarrassed. And I went in and apologized to him in his bedroom. And I came back to the dinner party and I just said, I guess everyone knows I have PTSD now. <laughs> um, and yeah, and it was kind of really relieving, you know, and, um, but I had to stop. The book took five years because I had to stop a lot and just go to therapy. And I can absolutely imagine that, that when you see it all in one place, it's a really good moment to pause and go, wow, a lot's happened to me. And really a lot has happened to you because I, I think I hold that I also have trauma and my parents joined a cult when I was a teenager and that kind of thing. But when I read about your childhood and teen years, I was like, I need to ring my mom and say thank you because I feel like reading it, your childhood was like a a strange combination of guns, trauma, and playing Annie from the musical Annie. (laughs) It's not like Angela's Ashes or something, but it's like, you know, uh, a lot of us have dysfunctional families. And I think including that in my writing and being honest about it without going overboard. Like I cut out, like there's a child here, so I probably can't say ass right, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> Sorry, child. Um, I, I cut out, you know, some violence and stuff like that. Cause it was just overwhelming for, I think for anybody to read, it's already has a lot of trauma in it. Um, but I wanted to leave it in because I feel like there's this myth that like you get raped and then like, that's your one thing. that Mm -hmm. that, like you're dealing with for the rest of your life. And actually what happens to a a lot of people I know is that we grow up in dysfunctional households where we're treated like garbage and we don't, and we have to shut off our intuition to survive in our house. And then we go out into the real world and we're still shut off. And so then we surround ourselves with toxic people because red flags don't look like red flags to us. They're just like, Whoa, what's that pretty thing in the wind? Um, And we end up getting, and it's not like, oh, I put myself in a position to get re-victimized and it's all my fault. It's more like I was raised to be a really great victim. And so I walked mm-hmm. right into it sometimes not knowing because I thought that's how I deserve to be treated. And I find that that was one thing that I really wanted to talk about is like, what happens if you experience three, four, five rapes? Mm-hmm. What if you, you know, are in a domestic violence situation a few times? What if, you know, you constantly experience... Um, sexual harassment at your job, but your job isn't even treated like it's a real job. Like the thing that was so weird about touring and experiencing sexual harassment was every day it would be a different group of men. And who am I going to call? Like Ghostbusters? Like who, who am I going to be complained to? There's no boss. Like I couldn't be like, you know, I'm being treated different or like people, you know, guys threatening to shock me on the microphone you know, while I'm singing and the whole time I'm singing, I have to worry about being shocked or having the person just turn my vocals down. And, you know, not to be boo hoo boo. I have a great life and I'm very, very thankful. I mean, all of you people came out here to hear me talk about my work and I'm like so honored and and thrilled. But I want to be honest that like these things happened and that they continue to happen. And how can we find ways to navigate through them that like lead us towards joy Because I shut down not just because of the bad stuff. I shut down and forgot the happiness and the joy in my life. Mm. And through writing this book, I had to uncover it because it was too heavy for me to read. And I was like, where's the joy? And so, and that was harder. It was so easy for me to remember my dad being super mean to me after my first performance at a school play. It was really hard for me to remember, you know, the time my best friend hugged me when I told her something really hard and made me feel like I was released from my secret. And in remembering those beautiful times, I just feel like it's opened myself up now at the ripe old age of 55 of finally being able to find happiness. 
that's a really lovely sentiment and the therapy clearly worked because that is a, that's an incredible piece of growth. I'll, I'll tell my that's therapist. That's the trauma therapy speaking. Uh, but it's, <laughs> it feels like a real growth. What was interesting to me is that what you say about what if it's not one incident where you go, ah, oh, that's my trauma like in a movie, Rosebud, Rosebud. But what if it's a number of things? And what I found remarkable was that I can see why the – both the anger and the joy that comes out in your work, the rebellion, the rebel girl that comes out in your music so strongly is coming from a place of defiance. And I really understood that more when I realized that even like authority figures that you should have been able to trust outside your home, um, and you have some lovely things to say about your mum as well as a dysfunction. And your, I loved the story of your mum bringing in feminist books and sneaking in magazines so that your father didn't see them and going off to volunteer on a domestic violence hotline and he didn't know about that. So, you know, there was clearly great stuff being modelled as well as very dysfunctional stuff, um, which is always difficult as well. The contradictions make it harder sometimes because you're like, but you're saying, but you're doing. Um, but the, could you tell the story that I found an absolute blinder about that you got called to the guidance counsellor at school? I forgot what I named him. Because um, I, I, I had to give everybody who did anything crappy a fake name for legal reasons. Um, and that was really funny, trying to think of names for people. I think I call him Mr. Cromley. I don't <laughs> well, remember what I call him. Let's call him Mr. Cromley. We'll I call just him Mr. Cromley. Mr. So I, uh, I sold weed uh, in high school. Uh, before that was legal. Is that in the book? I don't know. Yes, yes, oh, okay. yes, it is. That's the introduction. That's the setup. Oh, so I sold weed and um, I was very nervous about getting caught because I had a bunch of weed in my locker. And uh, I got called out of class while I was reading Canterbury Tales sure. um, in front of the class. So it was a really memorable moment. You know, when somebody comes to the door with a note for you in school and you're like, oh, shit. Um, and so I was being pulled out of class by my guidance counselor, Mr. Cromley. And uh, I went down there and I thought, he, they opened my locker, they found out I have weed, I'm going to get expelled, that my life is ruined. And instead, he, I guess he, he knew that, because I'd been busted for drinking at school and all kinds of stuff, um, and suspended. And I had to take these drug classes and he was the head of the drug class. I don't know if that made it in the book either. But uh, he ran this, like, anti-drug class. But then he calls me down, and I'm like, okay, he's going to bust me for the weed in my locker. And he's like, do you know where I can get ecstasy? <laughs> and I literally, I still have never taken that drug. Is that MDMA? MDMA, yeah. Okay. Is it Molly? Is that also what it's called? Molly, Mandy. It comes under a number of names. I think ecstasy might be MDMA plus speed or something like that. I don't know. Okay, I, I, I just, I just need to know. Um, Because people are talking about it, and I'm like, ooh. But I was like, I don't know where to get that. I don't use that. I don't know where to get that. And he's like, well, because my sex life with my wife is really bad, and I heard it will help with my sex, your sex life. And he's like, you know, you have a boyfriend. Like, what's your sex life like? I'm 16. Like, I'm like, uh, I don't want to talk about that. And. I also thought he was trying to entrap me because he was like the drug teacher to get me to say, I know where ecstasy. So like, I couldn't go to the principal and tell them about it because I couldn't tell if it was a trap or what it was. So he said all this creepy shit to me and I left. And then I was trying to go to college at the only place I could afford to go, which was the Evergreen State College one state over and had very inexpensive tuition. And, uh, he needed to sign the form and I, that I'd mostly filled out. And I went in there and again, he was like, you shouldn't go to college. You're not college material. You are really cute and you could marry someone who has a good job and I bet they could buy you a convertible. <laughs> and I was just like, what is this? Like, what kind of porn is this guy watching? Like, <laughs> what is his thing with like, whatever? And he's like, yeah, like, you, you know, you could get, like, there was a paper plant that people worked at. And he's like, you could, you could get probably a manager from the paper plant to marry you. And you could work, you could get in the, uh, the car and drive around. You'd be so cute. I was like, 
what the hell? Can you just sign my paper so I can go to college? And he kept stringing me on and being like, oh, I got to leave the room. I got a phone call. And I just sat there being like, am I ever going to get this paper signed? And while I was sitting there, there was a space I hadn't filled in that was like, why do you want to go to this alternative school? And I was like, so I don't have to listen to my guidance counselor tell me I'm not good enough to go to college. And then he came back and signed it. But after really seriously telling me, I was never going to make it. I feel he should have read it before he signed it and said, change that answer. (laughs) But I feel that the guidance that the guidance counselor was meant to give you was somewhat lacking. Um, What a guidance counselor. That is an extraordinary story. But I went back. Years later, after I discovered feminism, I I ended up kind of just with some time to kill in Portland, Oregon, where I went to high school. And I was outside of my high school and I was just like, fuck it. And I went in and he still worked there. And I filed filed a formal complaint against him. And it turned out that he had several other complaints against him already. So I'm really glad you did because that man was a very sleazy man. He should not be saying, I can imagine you in a convertible. Well, she, firstly, he should not be saying, can you get ecstasy and how's your sex life? That's, he, he's, uh, yeah, I hope he got fired and is not allowed to work anywhere near children or teenagers. I, mean, I think he's dead now, so like, <laughs> okay, I probably well, could just say his name. Well, like, <laughs> I don't know. If, what was that? Praise be. Okay, this is, <laughs> this has taken a weird reverse handmaid's turn. Um, but, that story really stood out for me because I was like, really, wherever you turned, you know, even when you were at college, you were then doing this incredible art, but you were undermined constantly at university. Can you talk a little bit about what art meant to you and how it broke you out of a lot of the negative stuff into the joy, but also what that struggle was like? Yeah, I mean, I had a real epiphany one day when I... I, I I realized that I had boyfriends just to help me pay the rent. Like, I, I would date these total dicks. Like, because I just didn't have enough money for rent. And I, I one day, I kicked this guy out who was just totally horrible. And he took all his art out of the duplex we lived in. And there was no art up. And I, I at the time, was doing photography. And I was like, why is there no, none of my photography on the walls? That was me. Like, I had internalized so much that it was like men were artists and women were not. This was the 80s, you know, so it wasn't like a thousand years ago. But I had a grandma who was an amazing ceramicist, and um, I remember talking to her about her art, and she's like, oh, don't call me that. Only men are artists. And I was like, what? Um, So it was also in the the 90s, the late 80s, early 90s was this time where in the art world, the the whole idea of like a master narrative, which should be questioned, was being questioned. The idea of like being uh, an artist with a capital A, which could stand for asshole or authority or Mm -hmm. awesome, whatever you want. But that was very much coming into play where people were like, we're challenging this idea of this like artist you put on a pedestal, you know, and I was just coming into being an artist at that time. And I already was questioning my own voice, like didn't feel allowed to call myself an artist. So it was very interesting for me to be entering um, the world of like visual art and then, you know, musical stuff at a time when like kind of postmodern theory was very prevalent because I think in one way it was really positive because it did make me question ever speaking Um, for anybody besides myself from a universal point of view. But it also made me kind of terrified to find my own voice. And I think it took me longer to be able to be like, no, this is my truth. It doesn't have to be your truth, but I can just say it. You know, like I was sort of like writing things and erasing them at the same time because that's sort of the time period that we were living in. But art was like, totally my escape. I knew I wanted to be an artist since like I was very little, like some kind of dancer or musician or interior designer or fashion designer or something. Um, and I really just chose photography because the coolest teacher at my school was my photo teacher. And she took us to see a Cindy Sherman show. And I was really blown away by it. And how lucky, how lucky am I that my first experience in an art museum, besides like you know, the Museum of Natural History and stuff your parents take you to to, like, see, like, old ships. 
was Cindy Sherman, you know? And so I got to see that and I was like blown away by it. And I wasn't necessarily a great photographer, but I did that for many years as my job and as um, my art, um, pretty much just because of this teacher. And I love that story because like, I didn't have a lot of cool adults in my life Mm. and she was like wacky and wore like hand earrings and had like spiky hair and talk like a normal person who saw you. And I didn't have people like that in my life. And I love thinking about her because everyone in this room probably is that person for someone else. You know, and if you think and start thinking of yourself as that you have the power to be that person for somebody else, it's pretty cool. You know what I mean? Like really just giving other people permission to be themselves is like so huge. Because a lot of people who didn't grow up being validated just need a kind word or validation to make it to the next place that they're trying to go. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. I I would suggest that there can be no artist in the world, especially who, one who's been raised in trauma, who has not had that person. There's that incredible story about Maya Angelou being just voluntarily mute for a while, out of trauma, not really voluntarily, but becoming mute. And a neighbor, uh, a lady just drove her to the library every day and she read every book in the library And so that when she spoke again, she could write because she had all these amazing literary references. And I always think we can't all be Maya Angelou, but we can all be the person who drives the little girl to the library. And that teacher is the anti-guidance counsellor. You have to have one of those. I think in order to be as punk as your work is, which is this combination of anger and power, you have to almost have both influences in your life. You have to have something to be very angry about that other people are also angry about that they relate to, but you have to have been given that permission. And what's interesting to me is there was the photography teacher, but then also Kathy Acker, who stepped into your life at another point. Can you talk to your experience with Kathy? Do you all know Kathy Acker, the author? She lived here for a long time. She loved London. Um, Kathy Acker, I went to a writer's workshop um, when I was like 18 or 19 um, in college. It was in Seattle. And I was actually doing a book report about her. And then I saw it in the local paper and I took the bus up and I made my first ever fanzine. But I didn't know it was a fanzine. It was back then we called them chat books. And it was just write, a bunch of writing that I did and a bunch of photography that I had made. And um, it was called Fuck Me Blind. And uh yeah, I gave it to her as my writer's sample and I got to meet her. We each got five minutes with her. So it felt really like, um, I really wanted to like utilize that five minutes and I, and I did. <laughs> and when she asked you, why do you want to write? What did you say? It was really interesting because I told the story so many times, but when I wrote it for the book, I actually had time to sit there and like be with it and not just be like spouting off shit to like, tell the story and get out of the situation. Um, I remembered specifically pausing before I answered when she said, why do you want to write? And I remembered this time when I was talking to my parents and I was basically asking for help and being denied and being treated like I was crazy. Now we call this gaslighting. Who knew there was a word for it in 1979? Um, But I remembered that feeling of asking for help and not being listened to. And I paused and I said, I I want to write because I want someone to hear what I have to say because no one's ever listened to me in my whole life. And that felt very unliterary because she was this amazing literary force, one of the best writers of all time, I think. And it felt very corny to say that to her. But I just felt like this is my chance. I have Mm -hmm. to tell the truth. And it completely was great because she looked at me and she's like, why are I was at the time doing spoken word, uh, like reading poetry at open mics and shit. And she was like, why are you doing that? Nobody likes that. (laughs) She's like, everyone goes out to smoke when the person gets up to read their poetry. (laughs) And she just looked at me and goes, you should be in a band. And I was like, what? Because I always wanted to be in a band. And um, so I went home and I started a band. Did she know you could sing? No. That's so interesting. She just intuited it. 
Because you had been a great singer as a child. I wasn't a great singer, but I mean, you know, I could carry a tune. It's, I mean, to play Annie, you've got to be able to yeah. belt out a little bit of, you know, yeah. belt out tomorrow. Yeah. Although your production of Annie, it had to be that, that some people complained that there were too many girls in it. Can you quickly tell us that story? Because I blame England. This audience will find that story hilarious. I don't know. Well, for people, I'm sorry for people who already read the book, but so I got cast as Annie at OW Fair Elementary School in fourth grade. And it was the first time I ever even thought I could sing. I sang at home all the time in secret, but it was like masturbating, like I didn't tell anybody. Um, and then I, uh, through some weird fluke, ended up at the audition and I, I sang in front of people and I got the part and I was like, oh my God, I can sing. Like I can actually sing. Somebody else thinks I can sing. It was my big debut. And then before um, the play went on, this woman who was from England, I, again, I want to say their real names, but I can't because of legal reasons. But it was this woman and her son, Timmy, Timmy Timmerton. <laughs> Timmy Timmerton and Mrs. Mom Timmerton. That sounds like, sounds like real names. <laughs> well, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's actually pretty close. But so he was the only English kid at our school. And... So she went to the school board and was like, it's sexist to do Annie because it's almost all girl roles. And so they had to change my big debut. Timmy Timmerton's mom fucked me up because she wanted Timmy Timmerton to get a part and he didn't. And so they changed it to a mashup. And this was before mashups existed of Annie and Oliver. <laughs> A so, mashup musical. It was a musical about a boy orphan and a girl orphan on two different, in two different countries, and it just came off like a bad porn shoot. Like it was like, <laughs> why is that person there? Why is that person like? And all the Annie girls, like all the orphans, were wearing dresses with rags sewn on them, and then all the boy orphans looked like Getty Lee from like ACDC. Like. <laughs> They all had, like, the black shorts and the white shirts and, like, like ripped up ties. It was so weird. But he was really good at that, um, where is love? Mm. He did that, and everyone cried. So I guess it was worth it for him, but he cut off, like, half my songs, and I was pretty pissed. I, I mean, there's, there are so few school shows that favor girls over boys. Uh, so that, that, that is a, a very annoying story, but still, you had the pipes. Um, he and did too. I mean, I gotta give I gotta give Timmy Timberton some credit here. Who, who's he now? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. I should probably find him on Facebook. I hoped that you were going to say he is to this day. Um, what's that Welsh boy's name? He's probably in like Pearl Jam or something. Yeah, <laughs> that's I don't know. That's what I think. That's what I think. He changed his accent. He changed <laughs> Pearl Jam. Imagine he's trying to take down Ticketmaster. <laughs> still, <laughs> after twenty years, he's still trying to take down Ticketmaster. <laughs> He's still asking, where is love? As we all are. Hello, Guilty Feminist. This is Deborah just popping in with a few quick announcements. We are coming to the Edinburgh Fringe. We're doing three shows at the Gilded Balloon in the museum on the 12th, the 13th and the 14th of August at 7.40pm. And we have an incredible lineup for you. On the 12th of August, Catherine Bohart and I will be talking to Helen Bauer and there will be poetry from Vanessa Casule, a favourite of mine. On the 13th of August, Kate Checker and I will be talking to Emma Siddy and there will be music from Isabel Rogers. And finally, on the 14th, it will be me and Chloe Petz talking to Lara Ricote with music from Katie Norris. As you can see, every show will be different, so why not come to all three? You can book now by going to guiltyfeminist.com and clicking on live shows. And speaking of shows, which are different every night, we're also producing the amazing storytelling show 16 Postcodes, which is at the Pleasance Courtyard every day at 3.30pm. Jessica Regan has lived in 16 different postcodes since moving to London from Ireland 20 years ago. And every day, audience members will help her to choose which stories she tells. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll rent because you won't be able to afford to buy. If you've lived in any number of flats or postcodes or you sometimes feel a bit adrift, this show is for you. To book tickets, go to edfringe.com and search for 16 postcodes. And we'll be back in London 
on the 8th of September at King's Place as part of the London Podcast Festival. And our old friend Jessica Foster Q and I will be talking to the very wonderful, very glamorous Dawn O'Porter about her new novel, Honeybee. Once again, for tickets, go to guiltyfeminist.com and click on live shows. If you want an ad-free version of this show, you can get it by going to patreon.com slash guiltyfeminist and supporting us from as little as £2.50 a month. You can also do the same with Acast Plus or Apple Podcasts. And if you felt like leaving us a five-star review, we would love you forever. It helps other people find the podcast, and that is a good thing. And now, back to the Guilty Feminist. You did start a band, and then that band started a movement or was at the centre or the, the sort of, it was the, a fizzy time where movements were required. I think we go through phases with times when suddenly there's something bubbling up, there's a revolution bubbling up. And it was a time when there was a revolution bubbling up and that you experienced a lot of sexism in the industry and you started a band that then started this right girl movement. Can you talk a little bit about what that was like? Uh, it was super weird. I mean, it was just sort of like a fanzine that then became like a bunch of women meeting in a room together and then people named it that. And then it's sort of like grunge, like no one called themselves grunge, but then that was the label put on it. But we were sort of like, oh, well. And then we took it and used it and people started Riot Girls all over the country. In the UK, there were Riot Girl groups um, and Huggy Bear was like the biggest kind of Riot Girl band amazing band that Bikini Kill got to tour with. And yeah, it was just, it started as like informal. I actually wanted, I was in DC for the summer and I don't know how to relax at all. So I have to always be doing stuff to avoid my problems. I don't know how to make friends. I have to like start a basketball team to make friends. Oh, you know I'm what I mean? so like, the same as that. Everything I start ends up as, as a cult and accidentally it's sort of like a, like a, you know. I think your family, uh, yeah, repetition yeah. It, thing all, is going on absolutely. here. Absolutely, it starts up. Not it's to, sort of my like, therapy. It's it, just. It's, uh, uh, I need to go to your trauma therapist because it's a hundred percent that I relate to that so hard that I I just want friends, but I always end up sort of starting a community, um, and you I don't know how to do it. I think possibly that same sort of thing of like how do you do it? How do you do that without starting a thing, an action, a going forward? Yeah. Um, and and at that time there was. Um, lots of young people. I mean, you started off in Seattle where there were lots of There's young Olympia. people. Olympia. Yeah, that's like an hour away. From oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but close. Close. To. close. Yeah, yeah. Proximity. Was part North of and that. Northwest. Yeah. And maybe I should have known this, I'm sure. Or maybe you hadn't said it before this book and I shouldn't have known it. Um, but I was quite amazed. And I don't want to dwell on a white man. Um, but I was quite amazed that you came up with the title. Speaking of you being able to come up with titles... Um, you came up with the title for Smells Like Teen Spirit, which is it's quite a big deal. I guess. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm also a feminist artist who's had a 35-year career. Yeah, yeah, So absolutely. I feel like that, like, you know what I mean, like, versus that. Oh, of course, like, of course. I mean, I know you're not saying that. I'm not I'm just, saying that I'm just all. saying it's like. I did preface this by saying I don't want to talk, oh, yeah, yeah. spend time talking about a white man. But I yeah. was like, I was, that, was, that was interesting. It yeah, was it was interesting like, it's a me. factoid if you didn't know it. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's definitely a weird, like. Forrest Gump of rock and roll, yeah, it kind of like moment. There was, like, yeah, there was this this community of bands that came up together and were all like helping each other out for a period, but then this sort of amazing community where there would be crossover like that, which is fascinating, and then uh, sort of just gives us an insight if we weren't there into that cool time when everyone's hanging out together, everyone's having success together, everyone's struggling together, everyone's got no money together. All of that amazing time that, you know, it just feels like such a slice of history. Um, but then it did start to kind of come apart at the seams. And can you speak to why that was? Why it started, why people started to turn on each other? I mean, there's a million reasons. If you're talking about in feminist community, why people turn against each other. I mean, we'd be here all night. Um, read the book. But uh, in terms of like, like scene stuff and like Olympia is like pretty much a small town. It's the capital of Washington state, but it's also a very small town. So there's not a lot to do. So people were making all different kinds of music. And it was like, if you weren't there, you might think like my band bikini kill and Bratmobile like hung out together every day. And like, you know, that was like our scene, but we were like hanging out with, you know, Nirvana and like this band fits a depression that was kind of like a heavy metal kiss without the makeup. And, 
you know, we were all friends and making different kinds of stuff. And like a lot of my friends were photographers still and it was a small scene. And so we needed to help each other out to create stuff. And the great thing was we weren't in a major market. So mm-hmm. it felt like nobody was watching us. So we kind of had permission to do whatever the fuck we wanted. But we also had independent labels like Kill Rock Stars and K that made us feel like if we made something, somebody would put it out. Someone mm-hmm. would put it on a cassette for us and dub it and get it out into the world. So we weren't just playing just for each other. Although that was often enough. Um, and I think that the whole idea that like, you know, this feminist scene was like separate from like the regular scene is completely not at all factual. But what was sad about the 90s was I feel like in Olympia, it was very white, and very middle class, not actually not super middle class. There's a lot of working class people there, but the scene felt very white, and very middle class. And it felt like this, for those of you who are older and remember, I don't know if you had this here, but it was like this major label versus indie label thing. And it was like, are you a sellout? which I'm so happy isn't a huge issue anymore. And as I look back and reflect, and I've done these like things where I'm talking about the book, I have to be 100% honest with y'all. I really think that that whole fucking thing was a way for white middle class people to stand in a place of oppression. And I'm using my 90s air quotes on that because it's not real oppression to be like, I'm on an indie label. But I feel like it was a way to stand in a victim place or a place that, and it was a way to avoid conversations about race. And it was a way to avoid conversations about class and gender and all of this stuff that needed to be talked about. It was a way to say, we're these purists who are against the man and not say, we actually, there's a lot of the man in all of us that we need to be discussing. And so I feel like it was a way to derail those conversations before they even happened. Mm. Um, and so I look back at my participation in those purity politics um, with, with regret. I feel like I stayed in a place of that. I do still believe, like for me, being on a major label was not a good idea. I love indie labels. I want to support indie labels. I love being on the underground scene. I don't want to going to see Taylor Swift in a couple days, but I don't want to be her. Um, And I'm actually going for Paramore, but you know. Um, (laughs) But like, I I think that those arguments are really shallow. And and at the time, I literally had friends, gay friends being beat up on the street outside of shows. And we're talking about who's on a major label. Who the fuck cares? Mm. You know, like when I look back on it, it seems very... Silly. And it was really painful to be in Olympia and watch our friends, you know, Kurt and Chris and then Dave um, become this huge international phenomenon. And the people um, who, who kind of were very involved in the scene politics in the town shunning them mm. and almost being like, don't come back here, motherfuckers, because you guys sold out. And I was like, why? They, because they didn't want to play $5 shows for the rest of their lives, they wanted their music to be heard. Oh, how awful of them. But I'm sure a lot of people are like, what? You know what I mean? Like, it seems really wild now to talk about it. But there was this thing, like, that they were sellouts. And if you look at the liner notes that Kurt wrote and a lot of the interviews he did, he, you could tell he was really plagued mm-hmm. by a lot of that. And, and again, I feel awful for my participation in any of that because I think it was ridiculous. Well, um... um Yes, I'm a bit like the sexism and the, more than sexism, the the structural violence and the literal physical violence that went on. The other side of that was there's a lovely story about um, when you had the gallery and there's, uh, you didn't, you know, it's really hard to keep a gallery open because it's very difficult to make any money. And Nirvana very early on came and did a benefit show for you where they just came and it played and gave you the money so the gallery could stay open for all this time. And it's, it, it, it was really interesting hearing you speak about it in terms of class, that, that they were really grassroots and working class. And then so when they saw that opportunity, they took it. And the problem is not artists on indie labels and it's not artists on major labels. The problem is capitalism and the power structures yes. that make us all grasp for, exactly. you know, either we're in penury and we're keeping our art as we want it to be or we're 
we're overwhelmed by the implications of fame and money and where that takes you. And I really loved your plea in the book. Really, it felt like a plea to me to not eat ourselves alive with purity politics and picking on each other and finding constant fault with each other where we could be teaming up and taking on the larger forces, which are really the problem. I think having productive arguments instead of unproductive arguments is the thing that I would look for most. Because I don't think it's really about, like, I know what you mean, and you're not meaning it as, like, glossing over stuff and teaming up. And be, you know, I know that's oh, not no, at all what you're no, saying. No, no, no. Um, but, I'm just trying to clarify yeah, that I think what you're saying is, like, it's important to recognize bullshit for what bullshit is if you're an artist and you're trying to do work in the world that a lot of times, especially if you're from a small town or from a small scene, people will feel like they own you. And if you start to get some success in the mainstream, people can get very angry and feel like you're moving away from them. Or if you're in a grassroots community and you stand out in any way. Um, I, a feminist uh, who I know, Robin Morgan, who wrote... Uh, she did these anthologies, uh, Sisterhood is Powerful, in the 70s. And we have many political disagreements. But um, she's an older feminist who I know, and she told me this amazing story about how she was writing for um, a feminist magazine in the late 60s, early 70s, and they decided that they didn't want anybody to put their names on the articles because they didn't want any of the women to stand out from each other because it was trying to be non-hierarchical. And she is a really great writer. And then she wrote a great article and she was like, okay, I won't put my name on it. It'll just be like everybody, you know, is equal. And then they're like, Robin, you need to tone down your voice because everybody can tell it's you because of the way you write. So you need, and she was just like, I didn't get into feminism to tame my voice mm. and to quiet myself. And I always go back to that story of like how, you know, hierarchies can work to, to make a meeting run smoothly and it's okay. It's not a big deal. You know what I mean? Like the, it can work at a dinner party to have somebody who's in charge of figuring out where people sit. It's not a big deal. Like we can use it as a tool. We don't have to create horrible hierarchies in our communities, spaces, or in our grassroots political organizing, but we can use hierarchy as a tool to get things done at specific times. And I feel like the problem comes in when people start being the opposite of things and being like, we're going to be so anti-hierarchical that people can't shine. And we start throwing water on people who shine instead of elevating them and helping them to shine more. And, and also, you know, a lot of times grassroots um, political groups are filled with people who have unresolved trauma who eat each other because when I, you know, I threw a lot of psychological Molotov cocktails through the wrong window um, when I was a young feminist and I really was horrible to some people and I've gone back and apologized to those people because I didn't know I could just talk and have a conversation. I thought I had to scream in your fucking face to be heard. Um, and I'm lucky enough that I, I feel my power enough that I can have productive arguments and conversations with people who I disagree with now instead of screaming. And I can also be empathetic when someone needs to scream at me. And I feel like that's the kind of stuff I want to see so much more is like people having productive arguments instead of throwing water on each other's shine. Mm. Does that make sense? It, it makes incredible sense. It makes absolute sense. And yes, we need to learn to disagree well and come to the party trying to understand, and even sometimes wanting to be persuaded. I feel like that's a very rare skill of someone who goes, okay, convince me. You know, Given that, what is the future of punk music, do you think? Uh, it's definitely not white. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, you all tell me. I'm sure there's tons of people in bands in this room who are like creating the music of the future. Um, I think there's so much to be done, you know, like we're in such a horrible time right now. You know, like we're talking about this book and whatever while, you know, my government is paying for bombs to be dropped on um, children and, you know, families and people. And um, it's really not to be Dr. Bummer, 
Um, but it's a really hard time. And I feel like people need punk and people need community to be with because a lot of people are really depressed and really sad. And it feels really, for me, therapeutic to be on stage. And I've just been in, I was in Mexico, I was in South America, I was in Europe, I've been in the States. I've been all around it. Every single show, I haven't heard people screaming, um, shut up when I'm talking between songs, which is what I used to hear. I haven't heard, take it off. What I have heard is people screaming to stop occupying Palestine and for freedom for Palestinian people. At every show, people have started these chants. And to me, that's so great because it's participation. And like to me, punk is based on participation. And if we don't participate in local politics, in like larger politics, in a scene that sustains us and fulfills us, and it makes sure that that it can be diverse, and I don't want to use like corporate inclusion speech, but like we need to make sure that people who don't have money can get paid for playing music, or else the scenes, the punk scene is is gonna end up being cisgender white people who come from money who can afford to play benefits till the day they die. And like, we can't have that. Like, we have to have a scene that acknowledges that people need to pay their bills and pay them fairly. We can't always ask the poorest among us of musicians to be playing benefits stuff. Like, let's get the rich white guys to fucking play the benefits. Like, let's get the major label bands to play the benefits and to pay the opening bands decently. Like, Whatever. I'm sorry. I'm on a soapbox. I had too much coffee. No, this is this is so wonderful, and I'm loving how wonderful you are in real life. It, you keep like I. You keep making me want to cry all the time, and it's it, which is you know these eyelashes so are so gross. Are you serious? This are, they, you are. Not, you guys, if you knew not. me, I'm like I've literally been like laying around for like three days. I'm like disgusting. I've been like watch. I got really deep into Freddie Mercury live videos because I'm going to. <laughs> going to Wembley Stadium to see Taylor Swift in two days and I'm like oh man that Live Aid that 20 minute Mm. Queen concert fucking from Wembley I've never been to Wembley so I've just been watching that like over and over watching all this Queen stuff and I was thinking like you know I love Nirvana and like Kurt was a friend and all that stuff but like kids being so obsessed with Kurt when he just kind of stood there it's like why isn't everyone massively obsessed with Freddie Mercury (laughs) Like, Jesus Christ. Like, it's absolutely insane what he could do vocally. Insane. And, like, and his stage, like, the whole thing. I, I'm sorry. I'm just going on a tangent because I want to entertain you guys. You're so quiet. Um, they're having a really good time. They're just gripped. Um, Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Okay. So, you know how there's, like, fairy tales and, like, folklore and stories that you have in your life? that, like, come back. Like, for me, like, I'm really into Rumpelstiltskin. Right. Because he could turn straw into gold. I think that's a very cool skill. Um, also, he really wanted to have a... He was a man who wanted to have a baby really bad. <laughs> um, and way in olden times. So he I had a lot of anger problems, though. I can see... I can overlook that. Um, <laughs> right, I think Rumpelstiltskin, yeah, he was, he was enacting his trauma on others, but... At the same time, he could turn straw to gold, and they weren't paying him, and all he wanted was a baby. But we'll get to that later. I'm wondering, do you have any fairy tales mm. or folk tales or whatever in your life that come back in your head that you sort of are like, like, or like the turtle in the hair, or, you know? Rapunzel. Because I feel Rapunzel is about the impositions of gender. It's about being trapped in a towel, which is your body, and... It's about your hair, which is, must not be cut because it is the sign that you are beautiful and wantable and desirable. And how will a prince find you and climb you unless you have this presentation of femininity? And I really see it as wanting to be released from the tower through cutting off this imposition of femininity, this projection of without this... It's the opposite of Samson. Samson's power was in his hair, but Rapunzel's power is in cutting her hair. It's in releasing and saying, let it go. And I often think it's a really beautiful story for trans people, actually, because it's about being trapped 
inside something that your you know that society has put you in and saying you can't move from here and you mustn't change the way that you present your gender so that's something that comes to me a lot wow i didn't know i was gonna get that um yeah i always thought she was cool because she had her own apartment <laughs> and like nobody could get to her and she's like fuck you I'm like up here in my tower but I mean I know it's like more complicated than that obviously that was it, very that was beautiful true. when you say it like that when you're a child you think it's like being locked in your bedroom yeah. but as you get older you think oh my god bliss a tower where no one could contact me and just loads of books and just yeah, but what's up with like the plumbing like I feel like you wouldn't have good water pressure and I, I like really like good water pressure so I am the same as that yeah the, the strong hot shower yeah when I first got to Britain and they had these like bird bath showers <laughs> oh my god you guys what's up with the one what are they called the the electric shower no the one that the rain shower you guys I have been terrified of rain showers forever because I feel like it's like the paparazzi. I don't have paparazzi trying to get at me, but I, it's like you can't get out of it once you get underneath it. And you're going to get your hair wet if you don't want to. And I don't wear shower caps. So I'm like, what the hell? What the hell? I just made peace with the rain shower this tour. Did I'm you? Like, I'm like kind of loving it. I think I know what you mean. Is it? Is it? It, it goes straight up and it goes straight down. Oh, I see. see and they see. have them in all the hotels in, in I see, I see. Yeah. yeah, the one that falls straight from the roof. There's no angling for you. There's no angling. Yeah. In, I think in the US, it's all about the angle. I think that shower is really for when you've had, you're freezing cold and you just want to completely immerse yourself. It's not for a quick shower when you need to be somewhere and you don't want your hair wet. I absolutely agree. Um, I, I'm, I'm with you on that, but I'm glad you have come to embrace the yeah. British rain shower. I just shower. wanted to let you guys know that I've gotten over my rain shower phobia. I'm Actually, <laughs> like today. Del- delighted to hear that. Um, I, there's something in your preface about what it feels like to sing. And I just want to ask you, what does it feel like to sing and be on stage with the audience completely with you? What does it feel like? I think it's the greatest gift, to be honest. There's something about it. You can move with music in a way that nothing else can move. Yeah, it's super fun. Like, being a singer is great. Like, you get all this attention. Everybody's staring at you. I mean, there's this stressful part of, like, if you can't sing because you got a sore throat, like, you're going to, you know, ruin everything for everybody and you're, like, the worst person in the world. So every morning on tour, I wake up and I'm like, am I the worst person in the world? Am I going to ruin everything? Um, but I take care of my voice and I have a lot of things that I do to, like, you know, I prepare. I actually really care about it. I always want to put on, like, the best show possible because I feel like people even leaving their apartments at this point is, like, such a win that I want them to feel like totally loved and <laughs> like, thank you for leaving your apartment. Cause it's, it's just really hard to get out of bed yeah. um, and just not eat, you know, macaroni and cheese and, and stay by yourself. So getting people in to be in a group, like I just really want to respect that and like give it my all. And so it feels really awesome to prepare, be ready, be on stage and then actually be singing the songs and really be inside them and then look out and see people, enjoying it like one of the best things actually this tour is i am uh singing this song about like the male gaze and then watching people crowd surf and i'm like people are crowd surfing to a song about the male gaze. <laughs> like, i don't know it made me feel like a very successful feminist artist like i was like yeah. look what i did i love that you say in the book every time i sing i stare these battles down i.e patriarchal battles trauma battles and shake loose another part of my story And while I've lost and regained my confidence as a performer many times, singing has never stopped being the tiny tornado I most want to be in. That is a beautiful turn of phrase, the tiny tornado I most want to be in. And those songs of yours, they are tiny tornadoes. And I think the reason people are crowd surfing is there is that feeling of movement in all of them. And I'm not surprised that you have been at the heart of movements because there's so much movement in your work, in your songs, and so much movement in this book. We have to finish up, but I want to ask you, is there anything you came to say that you didn't get to say? The music that comes out of England is so great and I've been so influenced by it and I'm just, I feel always thrilled when I get to be here. Like trying to figure out how, what London is about is really interesting to me because like I don't really get it. Like I don't, you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, it's not New York, but it's not. Like, I was walking around London and just being like, what would it be like to live here? And so I'm just really thrilled to be on the same ground as, like, you know, Paul Weller and, like, you know, like, 
Viv Albertine and, you know, like all these great artists who I so love their their music, Freddie Mercury, who I, I mentioned before. So many great punk bands have come out of here that have totally like changed the world. And I'm so thrilled to just be soaking up that energy like a fan and a tourist. Like it's very enjoyable. Well, it's absolutely wonderful to have you here and you are very welcome in London anytime. Oh, wait, I wanted to say something. Yes. Because I forgot to say it the other night on stage. Yes. Because, okay, so you know Viv Albertine is from The Slits and she wrote two really great books. Um, and I was thinking about all these bands, like the Raincoats um, are hugely influenced. And there's, there's, I think, a chapter about them in the book. And um, The Slits, and I was thinking, you know, I love the Slits music and I love the production on Cut so much and it really opened these pathways in my brain. But the thing that really influenced me that I wanted to leave y'all with is this cassette tape that we had in the 90s that someone on tour gave us. Um, And it was in, in a radio interview that the Slits did. And this was in, what, 70, like 70, like when would that be? 77, 78. So this is like 77 or 78, these women are doing this shit, right? They're totally challenging the idea that they have to play their instruments in a certain way. The raincoats are like doing weird ass time signature shit and making up stuff like crazy make em ups that sound like it's falling apart, but they're like this beautiful cacophony of sound that just, I don't know, it does touch a place in my brain that has not previously been touched. But getting back to the slits more than their music influencing me this fucking cassette tape of them doing a radio interview where this man called and was like asking these kind of offensive sexist questions and one of them goes I'm in the phone box around the corner (laughs) and it was like calling him a pervert without calling him a pervert and it was like performance art and then Every time when they would get asked the like, what does it feel like to be a woman in a band question, they would play a tape of, um, for those of you who are old enough to remember, ticker tape. It's like a sound that happened on the news. It was like, they would play that on a cassette into the mic to cover up the annoying question. (laughs) And I was like, wait a minute, I don't have to be this like ambassador for feminism who walks into every room and is super nice to everybody to prove that we're not all bitches, I can actually have fun and be a fucking jerk like I am. Like, I I can just be irreverent and, like, be myself. Like, that tape that someone handed me at a show totally changed my mindset. Mm. And I guess I'm just saying that because there's people in here who are in bands and it's like, people are watching what you do and listening to what you do and, like, if you do an interview as yourself and say like the real shit, like somebody is going to hear that and they, it could change the way that they're able to do their shit in the world. So um, I don't know. That's it. That's all I had to say. You've told us some really great things. Um, this is going to be broadcast out on the Guilty Feminist uh, feed. So I wanted to ask you if you have an I'm a feminist, but it's a, a confessional like I'm a feminist, but one time I went on a women's rights march, popped into a department store to use the loo, got distracted trying out face cream. And when I came out, the march was gone. Um, do you have anything like that? Any feminist confession? Okay, I don't have a I'm a feminist, but because I don't believe in that, because I think it's just there's so many different ways to be a feminist. Like, I don't think there's any reason to ever be guilty about somebody's your behavior unless you're like hurting somebody. But can I just... Yeah. The thing you just said is totally kooky because I was at the Dyke March with Joan Jett. And not to brag, (laughs) but I have to tell this story because something almost identical happened to me. I was at the Dyke March in New York City with Joan Jett and we were marching together and there was a group of people and like Joan doesn't know, like she doesn't really get that she's famous. And so she just is like, hey, whatever, you know, like I'm going to get a sandwich. And so we're like in the dyke march and then she's like, I want some tiny Ritz bits. Like there are these Ritz crackers that are really tiny. They're called like Ritz bits and they're like little tiny Ritz bits. And she's like, Kathleen, I really want some Ritz bits crackers. And I was like, okay, Joan. 
there's a deli. And so me and Joan accidentally, because everybody's going to follow Joan wherever the fuck she goes, because she's the queen of rock and roll. Ev, the whole fucking march went into this deli. Oh my God. And watched Joan buy Ritz, baby Ritz Fitz crackers. So wow. I'm a feminist, but I helped lead the dyke march into a deli to buy tiny Ritz Fitz crackers. That's the greatest one we've ever had. Um, by far the greatest one we've ever had. Uh, can I just say, if you haven't bought this book, please buy it um, and read it. If you have bought it but you haven't read it, don't leave it in that big pile next to your bed of books you're going to get to. Actually read it. And it makes a great present. If anyone's having a birthday or Christmas... You you're could, so nice. Yeah, seriously, it makes a great present for everyone you know. Like, think about, you know, your sexist uncle at Christmas? He would love it. <laughs> he would love it. Uh, but it's a, it's, if you've got young girls in your life, young women in your life, um, this book... Read it first, though, before you give it to any young people. <laughs> oh, yeah. I FYI. Mean, oh, okay, yeah, no, sure, sure. But, like, you know, it's not age-appropriate for everybody, but certainly at, like, a mid-to-late teen... Reading this, you would feel like you were not alone. And it's been in every generation and you can break out of whatever trauma you're in and you can make a noise and you can take up space and you can find your talent and there's a Kathy Acker out there for you. And this book could be your Kathy Acker. So get it, read it, give it, lend it, do whatever it is that you need to do because it really is something special. Can I have a huge round of applause? Um, I, Thank you I so wanna... much. You've been such a wonderful moderator. I really appreciate it. I want to try on your clothes. Uh, Kathleen Hanna, thank you so much. The Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.